start by just asking you uh, just a couple of questions. Um, and this really does follow on uh, very much from what Anne was talking about and in terms of kind of how we, we feel. So I want to know what comes into your mind when you hear the words orphans, orphanages, um, and countries like Africa, Cambodia, Nepal. Okay, so maybe you're thinking words like vulnerable, AIDS crisis perhaps, uh, need to rescue children, feel sad. And what comes into your mind if you hear the words orphanages and the United Kingdom? Something different perhaps, Dickensian, Oliver Twist, possibly sex abuse scandals. Okay, so I'd just like you to hold that thought. Um, I'm going to be talking to you, I'm sort of honing in on, on an area that Anne has uh, touched on, um, which is emotions and how they shape our behaviour. And I'm going to be talking about orphanages and I'm going to be talking specifically about orphanage volunteering and the problems with orphanage volunteering. But before I go on to talk about that, I want to tell you a story. It's actually a little more of a confession. Okay, so this cute bundle of fluff here is Alfie. He's an RSPCA rescue cat and he joined our family about a year ago, roughly around the same time that I left the RSPCA. So I took a part of the RSPCA mm. with me. When Alfie arrived, he was really skinny. He was in a very sorry state. He'd come from a multi-animal household. Um, he was you know, very skinny. He was quite yellow, we, we assume, from kind of having to sleep in his own urine. And it took him quite some time to realise that he didn't need to find his own food, that he would be fed. And on a couple of occasions, we found him tucking into packets of crisps, not open packets of crisps, packets of crisps that he opened himself, ripped open and devoured. I have to say we were very pleased that he chose the Changi cheese flavour and not the fiery chilli and that I wasn't on litter tray duty that day. <laughs> but the point here is that I took pity on Alfie and um, he started to learn very quickly as cats do that if he gave me that big eyed extra fluffy look that I'm absolutely convinced cats do that he would get extra biscuits. And that's what happened. Now, I should know better. I've worked in animal welfare for years. I was with the RSPCA for a long time. I did a lot of work on cats. I'm a responsible cat owner. I know what cats should eat. I know that if you overfeed cats, they get fat very quickly. I know they don't need extra bowls of biscuits. But my emotions got the better of me. So, let's move on. So I now work for the Better Care Network, um, which is one of many organisations part of a global coalition called Rethink Orphanages. And if you're anything like me, when I first started doing this, this job, you're probably wondering why is there a problem with orphanages and particularly why is there a problem with orphanage volunteering? So here's some... I think little known facts about orphanages and, and, and orphans. And the first is that 80% of children who live in orphanages are not orphans. They have at least one living parent. So I'm going to repeat that. At least 80% of those children that we know of as orphans are not actually orphans. They have a parent. And so it's not an abundance of orphans that we have the problem with here, it's poverty. <coughs> Children go to orphanages to access education, amongst other things. And decades of research has demonstrated that orphanages are harmful for the child development. They're bad for children and they're bad for their well-being. And that's why there's now this global care reform effort to move away from orphanages as a model of care. So how does this relate to orphanage volunteering? So I've just mentioned the care reform effort. 
But all the while this care reform effort is happening, and it really is happening in country, <laughs> there are organisations working with orphanages to reunite the children in those orphanages with their families and to, uh, to, to help orphanages to become other, other, other sort of daycare centres, uh, you know, that sort of thing. But those good intentions, the orphanage volunteering and the funding support that uh, you've, you've probably sort of seen online quite a lot, a lot of charity support for orphanages, a lot of church support for orphanages, that is weakening the care reform effort. It's also then perpetuating this cycle of children being separated from their families. And in some countries where, which are tourist hotspots, we've actually seen an increase in the number of orphanages. So people have recognised that there is a business in children. Children are the commodity, they attract tourists, they attract money, and orphanages are being created to attract tourists. It is also harmful for children, and this is a really hard point to swallow because young volunteers, they, they go to orphanages, and this image on the screen here is something that, that volunteers will, will experience. This is, this is how they are often greeted by children. Children who want to hug them, seem so pleased to see them. And that, that quote is from some research I'm going to talk to you about in a moment. But they do always seem so happy to see you. But actually, this is indicative of a child with attachment disorder. And they're always pleased to see anyone new. But they also have to very quickly say goodbye to those volunteers who come into their lives. And that just harms them. You know, already very confused children. They need stability and a primary caregiver. So, um, traditional campaigns weren't working and uh, this is this is where I joined the Better Care Network at the end of last year where it, where it was recognized that there's a lot of noise now about you know the problems with orphanage volunteering but it wasn't getting to the people whose behavior we wanted to change which was the orphanage volunteers and you know when I started this job I just thought well actually this is just exactly the same as we had when we were looking at cat population control um, and, you know, the issues there that uh, we were trying to talk to cat owners about um, how to, you know, to, to get them to sort of neuter their cats. But we were talking about the fact that without neutering, it was going to lead to an increase in cat population. That message was falling on deaf ears in exactly the same way that that you know, same message is, is falling on deaf ears with volunteers. So we needed to kind of understand sort of in the same way that we did for with, with, through the cat population control group, what, uh, you know, what, what are the reasons, you know, how can we better engage with, with volunteers? So research, uh, just to find out what influences orphanage volunteering, qualitative research in the UK and the USA. Um, the UK and the USA are the, the two biggest sending countries for volunteers overseas to, to, to volunteer in orphanages. Um, the third one is Australia, and we spoke to gap year travellers, um, so 18 to 22 year old gap year travellers, and also short term missionaries as well, um, people who were thinking of or volunteering in an orphanage. And I'm just going to run through some of those insights. So it's, it's undertaken by good people. You know, they, they've previously volunteered in um, a domestic setting. So in a UK context, it's uh, people perhaps who have uh, been through the sort of Duke of Edinburgh award at school. They want to kind of transfer that good intention, those, uh, that volunteering experience overseas. It's important to have a safe way to travel. So they want to explore a new culture. They want to kind of... Um, go abroad, uh, their parents need to know they feel safe. So um, actually the, the whole sort of orphanage volunteering package is, is great for that. It kind of, the parents know the children are safe because they've gone through a volunteer operator. The whole is greater than the sum of its part. Now this is re was really important for us to understand because at the starting point of doing this research, we were looking for an alternative. We wanted to be able to say to people, please don't volunteer in an orphanage, but hey, go and do this instead. But that hey, this go and do this instead doesn't really exist. So 
what young people were looking for was that opportunity to travel, just as a, a short burst during you know, sort of their, their traveling. They wanted something that was low cost. They wanted something that was safe. And that is very unique to the voluntourism sector. Um, and what we didn't want to be doing was saying to people, don't volunteer in an orphanage, but just go and hang out with vulnerable children somewhere else. That, that wasn't on offer. It's heavily influenced by parents, um, church leaders, institutions, you know, particularly you know, in that sort of the, the um, sort of short term mission um, sector. Um, uh, but, but, you know, there, there is this sort of, you know, they, they're, they're following what their parents do, what their parents think. And there's a big sort of social influence as well. So people will look for testimonials online um, and just follow what other people are doing. There's lots of very positive stories out there about, you know, I went to this orphanage and I had this great experience. Um, and people will seek out those sorts of testimonials. And it is ultimately, as I said, driven by this desire to give back. So actually, our ask to not volunteer in an orphanage is counterintuitive to their beliefs. And there is this sense of it being a moral obligation. People feel that they just need to help others who are less fortunate themselves. So we're seeing these sort of strong beliefs, moral obligation. And as Anne sort of touched on earlier, the one thing that was, um, you know, we actually hadn't realised and was kind of the key insight for us with this research was the strength of cognitive dissonance that occurs even when there is some awareness of the problems, people choose to ignore that. And just to kind of clarify what cognitive dissonance is, it is, is when we, we experience that sort of conflict between our attitude and our behaviour and our, our beliefs. And, and we seek ways to reduce that. And uh, I think Anne's example, actually, of the, the, the pig's ears was, was you know, probably a, a you know, very good example of, of cognitive dissonance. And even the, the squishy dog faces as well. People will just seek out information or, or something to support their belief that, no, that my way is, is absolutely fine. So comforting lies is what we look for. Okay, so if we just pause for a moment and uh, just to bring us back into the room for an animal welfare conference, um, I just, just want to sort of sum up what those, those insights are telling us. Now, we know there's a knowledge deficit. As I said, you know, that it, I'm not alone in, in, in being unaware of some of those facts about orphanages and orphanage volunteering. Um, but as uh, Anne has already talked about, it's, um, it's not easy to kind of engage people in behaviour change just simply by giving them information. That's not enough. But to summarise, really, we've, we've got very strong beliefs, we've got very strong feelings, uh, positive feelings about orphanage volunteering, so um, the, the attitude and all sort of element. There is, are sort of these strong social norms, some strong social influence, and it stands for kind of what people, how people want to rep be represented, what they see themselves as. So volunteering in an orphanage equals I am a good person. And um, so psychologists talk about us having two sides to our brain. Uh, there's the reflective, planned, you know, rational, sensible side of us. And then there's the, the other side, the automatic side of the brain that is responsible for getting in, into all sorts of scrapes and poor decision making. And that's the emotional side. It's very impulsive. Um, and I found this quote, which I think sums this up beautifully <laughs> and I think this is attributed to the psychologist Jonathan Haidt uh, and he describes it these two sides of the brain as the emotional tail wags the rational dog so bearing all that in mind about sort of the strength of, of people's beliefs and feelings and think about that role of cognitive dissonance if you were to right now decide you wanted to volunteer in an orphanage hopefully you won't after listening to me talking about it but if you did and you googled orphanage volunteering amongst all of the ads which would be offering this amazing experience to to spend time with children in an orphanage you would find these headlines so that information is there but if you see yourself as a good person wanting to do something good how would these headlines make you feel do you want to feel like you're part of a problem or causing harm, would that make you stop and think? Or would it make you ignore them? <laughs>
Okay, so in terms of the campaign that we're now developing, I had hoped that I would be able to share with you today the campaign, but we're not launching now until the 20th of November, so please keep your eye out there. So what I'm going to do is talk you through the process that we're taking um, from having understood you know, more about what influences orphanage volunteering, how we're translating that into a campaign targeting young people, and how we are intending to change behaviour. And this is all underpinned by behaviour change theory and will be evaluated as such. So I can come back here maybe next year and tell you if it works. So the first thing we had to do was to, to think about our messaging. So previous efforts had very much focused on criticising orphanage you know, volunteers, volunteers or criticising that motivation. And that didn't work. That's where cognitive dissonance sets in. That's what lands on deaf ears. So we had to find another way to engage with people and, and find that kind of common ground. You know, where, where would they be happy to engage? What, what's the point at which we can agree? And where we found that sort of safe space was to talk about orphanages as the model of care. So if we go back to those questions that I put to you at the beginning, and we have a picture here of Oliver Twist. Orphanages are outdated. They are unacceptable in a UK context. So why is it OK for them not to be OK in the UK, but they're OK in other countries? But the other point is that you know, we know that those words orphans and orphanages, it's a bit like the words puppies and kittens and rabbits and anything else cute just turns us to mush. So we can't just keep talking about orphans and orphanages because, yeah, deaf ears, mush. So we want to focus people on families and the fact that family is better. So our core proposition here is that we make families, not orphans. And that's kind of our rallying call and how we're going to be sort of uniting people to be part of the solution. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to work with, you know, obviously we're, we're trying to engage with young people here and um, young people today do seem to really care. I think we are about to, or, you know, sort of we have this growing, you know, generation of social change makers. So that's what we want to em embrace. You know, we've seen young people in America really take charge and do something on anti-gun crime, you know, um, in response to sort of the shootings in schools. They're saying, no, that's, that's enough, you know, we're not standing for this. So that's what we want to create here. We want to use you, those, those young people to create this, this youth-led social movement for change. Go away, Mr. Right. Yep, OK. So how does this translate into behaviour change? So when we carried out our um, research, we identified that there were three audience segments. And any good uh, marketing campaign, I think you know, Mark, Mark was sort of talking earlier about you know, how, how, do we, how do we learn? How do we sort of bring this to life? You know, we do need to think in terms of kind of traditional marketing and look at how the bigger companies do it. They do this. They understand their audiences. So we've got three audience segments here. And I apologise for, apologize for the, the youth speak. <laughs> this is internal speak, not external speak. If young people heard us talking about unwoke and woke, they would just say, shut up. You have no idea. And we don't. But we have our unwoke segment, we have our woke reactives and our woke proactive. <coughs> Jennifer, she represents our unwokes. She also represents the majority of orphanage <laughs> volunteers or prospective orphanage volunteers. They're our big problem group. She is really wedded to the idea of orphanage volunteering. You know, she really wants to make a big difference in, in children's lives and orphanage volunteering to her is, is the way to do that. And, um, you know, she might not yet have volunteered in an orphanage, but she absolutely believes, you know, that this is the right thing to do. Dan, he, he has volunteered in an orphanage, um, but just recently he started to hear some negative uh, stories about orphanages and orphanage volunteering. And this is where the cognitive dissonance sets in. So he is, uh, you know, his, his experience, you know, was, was positive, but he's heard this negative, you know, the negative stories about um, orphanage volunteering. 
but he's still more likely to say, yeah, but it was kind of better than where they came from. So no, that's fine. I'm quite happy that orphanage volunteering, it's still a good thing. And then our last segment, the Hannahs, are, uh, so they, they, they've been through it. They're probably, it's a process of, of, of a combination of, of just time and experience. They've recognised that having volunteered in an orphanage, that this isn't, isn't the, the right thing to do, that there is another way. So having identified that, that sort of audience segment um, and also sort of understood sort of where people were, particularly that unwoke you know, segment um, that you know, really strong beliefs and they're sort of holding firm onto that, uh, we wanted to sort of identify the best behaviour change theory to help us with this process. And this came down to the trans-theoretical stages of change model, which I'm sure many of you will be aware of, but probably think of it more in terms of sort of health behaviour change, so smoking cessation or um, other addictions. And I must admit, when we first started talking about it with our research agency, and this was suggested, I thought, really? You know, in the context of orphanage volunteering, how does that work? But... What I hadn't realised, actually, and I, I now do, that uh, there is a, another layer to this, the stages of change. So most people are familiar with pre-contemplation, contemplation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there's also this process of change, and that is the process that people will go through to move through those stages of change. So if you can just see that along the bottom, conscious raising, dramatic relief, etc., right the way through to, to social liberation. And I apologise for this horrid slide, and I'm hoping that if the slides are shared afterwards, you can look at it in a, a bit more detail afterwards. But there's two dimensions to this process of change. There's a cognitive dimension, so that huge kind of attitudinal piece, and a behavioural dimension. Now, our insights told us that we were way off being able to sort of engage people in behaviour change, that we needed to address this attitudinal piece first. That's where we needed to start. So we need to engage people emotionally. We need to create that emotional arousal. We need to help them to sort of reevaluate the role of orphanages as models of care for children and to reevaluate their role in that. And then we move them forwards towards that commitment and commitment to behaviour change. So how are we going to do this? Well, Again, we're looking at youth culture again, and it's really important to understand your audience in terms of what they do. We're building a campaign very much sort of set in, in youth culture. And um, young people today, as well as being social change makers, they watch an awful lot of TV or an awful lot of Netflix, I should say. So we're creating um, a docufilm, a short docufilm, very much for this youth target audience. So it'll be very sort of punchy. And it's... It will contain stories from the perspective of care leavers um, about orphanages and, you know, the need for change. But it, it's them telling the stories about life growing up in an orphanage. And, you know, the, the film on its own isn't enough to change people's behaviour. And you're probably sitting here just thinking, yeah, right, you know, kind of, how's that going to make a difference? But this is where we need to think about, well... That's just our starting point. How do we move people through this, this process of change? How do we get our Jennifers to turn into Dan's and Dan's to turn into Hannah's? <coughs> so we've set behavioural goals for each of our, um, our, our sort of audience segments here. And this is sort of really important. Again, when it comes to behaviour change, really understand your audience really understand those audience segments and be really specific about what the, the behaviour is that you want to focus on for each of the, those audience segments. So our behaviour goals for Jennifer is simply to watch this documentary. You know, we, we want to kind of emotionally arouse her. We just want to kind of get that reaction from her. But we also want her to share it online. So again, looking at youth behaviours online, this is about sort of the, the, the passive engagement piece. You know, we simply want her to share it with her friends. We want to create echo chambers within her social groups so that we can start to create new social norms. By the time we get to Dan, it's about committing to not volunteer in an orphanage. And a, someone, if someone makes a public commitment, that's a really good tool for kind of hooking them in and sort of um, as an indicator for behaviour change. So that's the point at which we hook Dan in 
and getting to commit to, to not volunteering in an orphanage. Hannah, she's, she's one of our ambassadors for change. She's already there. We need to use her to kind of create uh, that, that bigger sort of social norms piece to sort of amplify her voice about not, uh, not volunteering in an orphanage and her reasons why, to demonstrate to others like her those reasons for not doing it. Um, I'll come on and talk about the peer-to-peer the -peer screenings in just a moment. But her online behaviour is the active engagement. We want her talking about this issue, so it's not just sharing, it's talking, it's having that conversation. So in terms of the actual interventions and how we're going to support Jennifer and Dan and Hannah, to achieve these behaviour goals. As I mentioned before, Jennifer, it is simply to watch the documentary and, and, and share to social. Dan, so sorry, just going back to, to Jennifer, we are going to be investing most of our, our money, our, you know, our, our, our kind of the kickoff of the campaign and our budget is primarily being focused on Jennifer. That's where we need to kind of make as much noise as possible and sort of generate that, that that response, you know, that create that sort of emotional arousal. But it's actually Dan who is our person, our segment that is most likely to wobble. He can go either way. He can continue forward in it with his commitment or he could very easily slip back. Cognitive dissonance is, is very sort of powerful. So we've got to really hook him in and just continue him on that journey. So as well as getting him to, to pledge, make that public commitment, we're also going to present him with, with uh, volunteer testimonials to do that, to that sort of social proof piece, just make <coughs> him realise that he's not alone, there's others like him, and just, just reinforce that thinking. We're also going to be reinforcing his pledge, you know, so he'll get a, a, a thank you message. We're creating a volunteer checklist, which is uh, part of counter conditioning to help him to sort of make good decisions about overseas volunteering and our stimulus control will be signposting to volunteer operators who have ceased orphanage volunteering. So we've got all these steps in place to help him along that journey. <coughs> it's a bit like snakes and ladders, really. Keep moving, don't slip back. And with Hannah, so we're creating peer-to-peer -peer screening toolkits. Um, we're talking to a student audience. Uh, we, we're hoping that they will be organising screenings in university settings, inviting Jennifer's and Dan's and lots of Hannah's to come along and watch this film. Um, and, you know, but they might equally just have this screening at home as well, just with a bunch of friends and uh, a few sort of discussion points just to get the ball rolling. We're also creating a Facebook group. We decided, um, that, that if I just go back to that point about the alternatives message and how challenging that was, that us telling people what, you know, don't do this, do this instead, you know, that doesn't work. And it never comes very well from anyone other than the people you trust. So we're going to get them through this Facebook group to tell us what good looks like, to share those good ideas and just, just create a new social norm around volunteering um, to support children. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, then the, the, the digital piece is, is sort of social media engagement and creating and building on that conversation. So in terms of evaluation, um, we can't change the world uh, through this campaign. I certainly don't have the budget to do it, or the, you know, the time to do it, but actually, more importantly, the data doesn't exist. I have absolutely no way of telling whether this campaign will reduce the numbers of orphanage volunteers from 100,000 to 50,000 over, over what period. That data doesn't exist, and those numbers are just completely made up. So what we're going to be measuring is intention to volunteer in an orphanage. And we're going to be looking at whether this campaign, through sort of a bit of a pilot period, it's a huge pilot, we're rolling it out in the UK and uh, the USA. Um, uh, it, it, we're measuring whether our approach, whether we've got the messaging right, whether the film was right for engaging people in creating that emotional arousal and whether we can st sustain that behaviour change. So that's what we're looking at. It's not actual numbers. Um, it will be whether we've, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be successful for the longer term in sort of challenging that or changing that intention to volunteer in an orphanage. So we'll be measuring that before the, the uh, well, using the film screenings, um, after viewing the screening, and then sort of looking at, at follow-up as well. What happened next? So if people do go, 
as we hope, I've, I am emotionally aroused enough about what I've just seen through this film that I'm going to pledge not to volunteer in an orphanage. We want to know what happens next. Do they follow that through or do they slip back? And specifically, we're going to be looking at changes in attitude, social norms and, and social identity, because we've identified those as the, the kind of the key constructs that are at play here. So we would expect to see those changes occurring, you know, within those sort of variables um, and, uh, and, and sort of changes in that, that sort of outcome variable of intention to volunteer in an orphanage. But it's, you know, I have to sort of say before we um, sort of wrap up really that, you know, I'm presenting here um, something that talks about individual <coughs> behaviour change and the change, um, in, you know, in behaviour of volunteers. If we just focus on that alone, we, we would fail. Um, I'm pretty confident we're going to do pretty well with this campaign, but, you know, there is so much external noise. You know, as I said, if you just go online, you will be swamped with advertisements. Um, you know, the, the term poverty porn is often used, but um, you know, words that would invite you to kind of rescue and save the lives and love these children, it's, it's horrific, really. Um, but we have to kind of focus on that as well. We can't just focus on this individual behaviour change alone. So we've been working quite closely with volunteer operators. Um, just in the last year since I've been with the Better Care Network, We've seen a number of them uh, cease orphanage volunteering, changing their policies. The <coughs> industry is, is sort of really changing its, its opinion on here, but it's a slow burner. There's an awful lot of volunteer operators out there. There's also a lot of orphanages that just recruit volunteers, um, you know, so that there's not even a company that they go through. And there's a whole heap of issues there around child protection and safeguarding. Those children are horribly exposed to all, all sorts of exploitation. So we're also working with the UK uh, Christian um, faith community, just starting a sort of a programme of work there, just to change, you know, um, attitudes and behaviours sort of amongst sort of church leaders. We've, we've got a, there's a whole system at play here, so lots of work that we need to do. But the key point there is that it's not just sufficient to look at individuals, you need to look at that macro environment as well. Okay, so I'm just going to wrap up with um, just a couple of points here. And, and the first one is just that it's really important to remember that it's how we feel that drives, you know, sort of how, really how we think about something. It's much more important. You know, we, we think in terms of how we feel rather than that rational decision-making process. So that's the starting point. How do I feel about this? And we don't always respond to hard facts. In fact, rarely, very rarely, and we will go out of our way to actively avoid those facts. So really think about that. You know, particularly, you know, we've, we sort of touched on, you know, the debate about sort of meat eating. You know, it's a really challenging issue, but people will actively avoid anything that just jars with their, their sort of perception or you know, concept of, of you know, what, what their world looks like. Finding that common ground is really important, and it, but it can be done. And again, I'll just go back to talking about um, you know, cat neutering and the work we did with the cat population control group. That you know, we were here, we'd all cat um, welfare organisations, we're here talking about you must neuter because otherwise it leads to an increase in cat population. Um, whereas the cat owners over here were, I'm not neutering because I think that's the best thing for my cat. So the common ground there is the love and the care of the cat. So we just needed to just adjust that messaging um, to, to, to sort of make sure that we we're on that common ground. That's really important to think about that. Dig it out, you will find it. And then the final point here is that, that point about sort of, you know, hooking people in. As I mentioned, you know, when we, if you think about sort of Dan, he's on a journey. We've hooked him in at that point. We've got him to commit to not volunteering in an orphanage. But if we let it go there, so if we had a one burst campaign and, you know, just the film, they'd all slip back again. They'd stick, go back to where they were previously. So that single burst alone isn't <coughs> sufficient to change behaviour. You've got to hook them in and hold on tight and look at all those other sort of external factors. Um, you know, consider that sort of external sort of social 
environment, you know, the, the influence of social norms, um, look at habits. I know there's going to be workshops about all of these issues, which uh, um, sound really interesting for this weekend, but hook them in and hold on tight. And then I just want to end on that, you know, bringing that, that quote back in again, because I just think it's so fitting, obviously, because it's an animal welfare conference here today. Um, but if, you're, if you leave with one thing, it's to think about behaviour change as a dog. And it's the emotional tail that wags the rational dog. Thank you. Thank you.